here tonight in this service. We're going to worship the Lord for a while. This is Wednesday night. This is kind of the kickoff. How many of you are in this place tonight? You're pastors. Lift up your hand. Amen. God bless you. How many of you are here for your first time for the revival? Praise God. Well, Right out of the gate, let me give you a little tip. Except a man humble himself as a little child, he will not inherit the kingdom. And what the Lord is doing here is not because of anybody. It's not because of anybody's worthiness. It's not because of anything in particular. It's because God Almighty has sovereignly decided to move. And if you humble yourself and you put away all your pride... And I know that's hard because I had to do that too. Forget about how many years you've been in the ministry and what all you've seen. I can always tell when a fellow hasn't quite got it yet because he'll always start off by going, well, I've seen, all, I've seen everything and this is nothing I haven't seen before. I say, well, Lord, just keep on. You'll get him eventually. Because I just kind of started over a year ago and just said, Lord, I've seen a lot been in church all my life. I've seen a lot of stuff. I've seen a lot of people healed. But you know what, Lord? I don't know you at all like I want to. There's more to you than I know. And Lord, whatever it takes for me to have that part of you, that's what I want. So whatever you need to do with me, Lord, if, if, if shaking me in the floor is what you want, that's fine. Just shake me all day. I don't care. If, if, if I have to have a child pray for me, that's okay. If I have to have someone who I, who's been in the ministry for a year and I've been in ministry for 15 or 17, Lord, that's okay too because you may want to humble me. But the Lord wants us to receive what he's giving. And I want to be holy before him. Because what God's doing is much bigger than just this revival. God is shaking this world. There's a change coming. And brothers... It's not about how long you've been doing what you've been doing, and I say that just humbly. It's not about that. It's not about how many revivals you've been to, how many times you preach. It's all about hunger. It's all about hunger because you can create a lot of things, but something you can't create is a hunger, and the Lord has to put that within you, and he's put it in you, and that's why you stood in line today, not because Carmen or Benny Hinn or anybody of note is here but because God is doing a great work and you're hungry for it. And you know what? I feel just like a little child tonight and it's Christmas. And I just want to just humble myself under the cross and just look up to the Lord and say, Lord, make me holy. Lord, take my mind and transform it, Lord, because I'm stubborn as I can be sometimes. Lord, just take that out of me, God. Take my will and conform it. Lord, I'm tired of trying to go my way. Lord, just conform me to what you want me to be because you're the only one who has sense enough to know where we're going anyway because you can see the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning, and I don't have a clue what you're going to do. But I just want to say I avail myself to you, and Lord, I am so happy to be a part of what you're doing, and I'm so happy to be in this place tonight. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I want you to do something for me. Just like children. Just like children who haven't had a piece of bread or water in four or five days. You forget about all your table manners here for a minute. And forget about everything that's going on and just cry out to the Lord and say, take my heart. Take my heart. Thank you. 
spending my life.
Sing a new song to the Lord, all you people. Hallelujah to the Lord. Who reigns forevermore. Oh, sing an honor to the Lord.
Just one more song, I promise we'll quit, but I just feel like singing tonight. Glory. Amen. People come in and ask the question, how do you do that for a year and two months or whatever it is? I've forgotten now. We're just here. You know, I used to plan things, not anymore. Uh, you just keep going because you keep thinking about how good God is. And, and listen to this. And how dead and boring church used to be. (laughs) 
I kind of, we, we need to make a new t-shirt that says, been there, done that. <laughs> Dead religion, been there, done that. Yeah. Have a songbook. <laughs> what can I say? It didn't work, did it? Glory. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> there is not, there's not enough money in the world to pay for what the Lord's doing right now. Hallelujah. <laughs> Everybody help me sing How Priceless.
could just hear you singing, How Priceless. Everybody, come on. How Priceless. How Precious. How Precious. In your just goes on and on and on and on and on. Your grace never fails. Thank you, Lord. By the time I think I've reached the end, Lord, it just starts all over again. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace on me. Those of you that are visiting for the first time, I want you to know that we've been here since Father's Day of 95, and for we have seen some miracles. And every one of these songs, we sing about the love of God, we sing about the mercy of God. I think about this last week, and you know, every week seems to dwarf the week before. And every, every Sunday, I look back at the week of revival, and I go, dear God. And this last week, we had... We had dancers from the local clubs give their life to Jesus. We had, we had, we had a warlock. We had, we had people from street folks from New Orleans come in here and get saved. We've had businessmen get saved. We've had students. And I look at them, everyone, the, the problems are so diverse, but God is so big. And I, I know here tonight... I know here tonight some of you have come with a lot of baggage, and maybe, maybe that's religious baggage, okay? You've come, and you're so steeped in religion. We're not, we're not down on any denomination here, friend. And what Lyndall just commented about the songbook just a minute ago, we sing out of the hymn book all the time here, all the time. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna, I would like for us to sing a 4,000 tongues, a Wesley song from the 1700s in just a minute, because we have thousands of tongues here. The chapel's full. I know the cafeteria and the choir room are filling up. But friend, we're not down on denominations or uh, your particular institution. What, what we're tired of is dead, stale religion. That's what we're tired of. That's what everybody's tired of. And those of you, those of you that might be here tonight that have, you, you just, you criticize this generation because they're not getting into the things of God. I'm here to tell you something. They're not getting into religion. No, they're not. But they are getting into the things of God. They're getting into the things of God. And I... 
It thrilled my soul just a minute. Don't, don't sit down yet, okay, unless you just absolutely can't stand up. Mike, come on up here, man. I looked over there, and I know you're a working man, and you got to work a lot, but I, how long ago was it, brother? A year and a month you gave your life to Jesus in this place. Hallelujah. Yes. And Mike, Mike came in here, and we're just going to, is that red hair? You got red hair? Is that what that is? It's kind of grayish. <laughs> but uh, Teresa, you come on up here too. Come on up here, Teresa. We'll just pick on the folks who got red hair tonight. But um, down here. another girl that God's just mightily touched. But uh, Mike, Mike came here. He came to this revival. Uh, how long were you going to stay? Um, one hour. One hour. <laughs> that was a year and a month ago. Yes, yes, yeah. it was quite a while. And uh, what happened, man? You came in, the, you, you're determined. You, I understand that you told your wife, you made a promise with her that you would come in what? Just one hour. So, so okay. we'll, we'll be here one hour, that's it, no longer, yeah. no matter what happens. And if it goes any longer, I'll get the kids, bring them in. They'll make, make a bunch of noise and stuff, and then we can get out of here. This is a heathen right here, friend. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, he's a reggae guitarist and just, uh, just... God, what happened that night, man? <sighs> oh, you stayed longer than an hour. Yeah, I did. I got up off the floor sometime around 1230. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. 30 years. And how long, how long you been on drugs and smoking dope? I was about 30 years a pothead, strong pothead. Couldn't do a day without it. I was down to a joint. I'm a boy on a mission. I mean, I, I wouldn't let the bag get that low before I was bugging everybody I knew to death, you know. You gotta, just gotta have it. And when I got home from the revival that first night, I took the bag out of the drawer, looked at it, thought about it, stuck it back in the drawer. And next morning I got up and went in the toilet. <laughs> yes, it's a victory! I love you, brother. You know what I love about that is, um, is that was without discipleship. Pastors, look at me, friends. I've never seen anything like this. Now, we have discipleship classes. We're pumping them through discipleship. We, we're doing as much as we can. And people ask us, what are you doing to follow up? We are doing everything, friend. We're following up thousands of people. But the Holy Ghost is doing more in an hour than we can do in a year, friend. Now, <laughs> Teresa, you came to this revival when? Um, well, I got saved. It'll be a year next month. A year next month. And um, how did you how did you hear about the revival? From my kids, my oldest boy over there. Come on up here, man. Now, this is good, friend. Look at the, the children leading the parents. <laughs> Now, there are, we've had 30, about 35,000 people come to the Lord, and there's nights, friend, we can pull up night after night people that have come to the Lord, but I love bringing the people up to you that have been here for a while, because people say, you know, the critics, they'll go, yeah, you know, but I want to know where they're going to be at tomorrow at this time. If you're like that, shut your face. <laughs> Just shut your mouth. I want to tell you, you are the biggest hindrance to the work of God. Why don't you be one of those people, as soon as someone gets saved, say something like, it's going to be great the rest of your life. You can live for God all the days of your life. Boy, don't get me on this subject, friend, but I'm telling you. But I just want to bring some folks up that, that are just, God has done a great work. Why did you want your mama to come to revival? Uh, um, she had a bad attitude all the time, and I just got... I got tired of seeing her just throw her life away. I, she's smoking uh, dope like it was cigarettes. I mean, she smoked more dope than my dad smoked cigarettes, and he smoked like three packs a day. And I, I mean, I just got sick of it. Is anybody listening? Hallelujah. You know,
I did a, a, a radio interview today in, from New York, and, and about an hour and a half we were talking to the folks, and, and, and they asked me, they said, how can you just keep going and going and going in that revival? What do you think, friend? You listen to stuff like this. The crime rate in this city alone is down close to 20%. Down. And we're always talking about praying grandmas and God bless your grandma and grandpas. And, but this is cool. <laughs> you know, these, these kids. And so you told her about the revival. Yeah, um, I heard about it from a few kids. I went, I went to a dead church, <laughs> and and they they brought me over here, and, and that's really when I gave my life to God. I went there for six months, and I didn't quit smoking. I didn't stop drinking or the dope or nothing I was doing, but I came here, and I just got filled up with the Holy Ghost, <laughs> and I, I quit it off. I, and I figured if he could do it for me, he could do it for my mom. He said if he can do it for me, he can do it for my mom. And what happened, Mama? Well, he stayed out like two, two thirty in the morning, and he has a pager, and I kept paging him and paging him. He never called me back or nothing. So when he come home, me and his daddy was sitting on the couch, ready to jump him, because we figured he was doing something wrong. And he told me he was over here at Brownsville on the floor, passed out. And I says, "Oh no," you know. I said, and "He said yes." He said, "Mama, I've been." He said, "That's where I was. I promise." He said, "You got to go." And I was raised in church, and. I told him I've seen it all. I didn't care nothing about it. And he kept on and on and on and on and on. And so I decided to come over here. I sit up there on the balcony and, and I run out the first two nights that I come. And especially when you give the altar call. I, I was cry I cried the whole time. And the third time I come, I come knowing I was going to give my heart to Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I know, Teresa, everybody wants to know, have you stopped, have you stopped, have you stopped smoking dope? Oh, yes, <laughs> definitely. Now, how did you do that? You didn't go through a program. How did you stop smoking after you smoked for so long? Well, I was like the brother over here. I didn't throw it away the first night because I want to make sure that I, it was going to last. And, and I, I, I held on to it for a day. And then after the day, I, I threw it away. And mm. I never smoked none since the day I got saved. And I found a bag about three months ago. <laughs> If you're bored with this, you got a problem. You found it. You said you found some pot about three months ago. Yeah, in my drawer. I did not leave the house without at least a joint. I did not live with, and I was like him. If I got a half a bag low, man, I was out looking for pot, and I didn't quit. And my kids can tell you until I found it, but um, God delivered me c completely, and I didn't think that that I could ever be delivered. And uh, I threw the bag. I flushed it in the toilet. Hallelujah. She flushed it down the toilet. This revival, God bless both of y'all, this revival has been about holiness, always has been, always will be. Now tonight, uh, we're going to pray with everybody here. We know the church is, is at capacity. It will be at capacity, I'm sure, all week long. And it may seem frustrating to you. You may have waited. I talked to one man from England who has been here for six hours waiting to get in. And it, you may have waited a while to get in this service. But let me tell you something, friend. There is an anointing in this place. And your pastors that are visiting, this is undeniable. This is undeniable, okay? We've had over a million people come through this church. And they keep coming from all over the world. And they, they fax us back. They email us back. They write us back. They let us know what's happening from deliverances, from habits, to revival breaking out, to you name the miracles. I mean, the only thing that we have not seen documented yet is the raising of the dead. But t uh, friend, I, I want to tell you why I don't believe we've seen that. I'm going to tell you why. Because we could not handle it. I, I believe that's the only reason the Lord is staying his hand. Because as a church, you think of your church, Pastor. If your church... If you went to a funeral, you had a funeral in your church, and you walked over and you said, get up. And, and that person rose up. You probably couldn't handle it right now. Maybe a year from now, maybe a year from now, you'll have your people in place. 
you'll have your, 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 your workers in place and you can handle a revival like that. But I, I think all that's coming. I want us to sing this. Before Chaplin comes just a minute and, and to speak to us, I want us all, everybody stand, oh, 4,000 tongues. And there's, a, there's one of the verses, he breaks the power of canceled sin. No matter what you're going through tonight, and you may be in the choir room, and you're stuck, you think you're stuck in the back of the church watching us on a large screen. Friend, you are right in the middle of what God's doing. You are, it doesn't matter where you are on campus. If you're watching from home, it makes no difference. The condition of your heart is what makes all the difference in the world. Let's sing this right now. Thank you. You may be seated. It's a joy to see you here tonight. On behalf of Pastor John Kilpatrick, who couldn't be with us tonight, he is traveling and will be here tomorrow night. We want to welcome you to Brownsville Assembly and to this revival. It's a joy to see you here tonight, and we want you to be blessed. I know many of you have traveled long distances. You've spent uh, great sums of money in order to get here. You've stood out in the sun this afternoon to get in this room, and, and we want you to know that, that uh, we are indeed blessed and, and we are indeed happy that you're here tonight. 
we, we're just glad that we can uh, host you. And uh, we want to be good hosts to all of you. And so if we can help you any way, please feel free to call upon us and let us know what your needs are. We're doing the best that we possibly can with the crowds we have. Uh, but, uh, you know, you really are the revival. It isn't Brownsville Assembly. This just happens to be the place where God is pouring out his blessings. But the people that come here are the, the, the real people who are the revival. And our people are being blessed tremendously. And we want you to know that we don't consider ourselves to be experts in this. As a matter of fact, we don't understand a lot of things that go on and how things happen. Every service is different. And, uh, you know, you, you may be here for one service tonight, and you may go away and say, well, I've, I've experienced the Brownsville revival. No, you just experienced one service. Uh, I've been here for, for almost the entire revival, and I can tell you right now that I've not experienced all of the Brownsville revival yet because every time I think, God can't do anything greater than that or anything different than that. Lo and behold, he does. Sunday morning, for instance, we had a Japanese pastor and a Chinese pastor standing here as we were receiving communion. And um, they exchanged uh, uh, some of the elements or emblems of the communion. And that dear Japanese pastor looked at, the, at this congregation and said, on behalf of my nation, I want to apologize for World War II. And then he turns around to this Chinese brother and says, and I, wanted, I want to apologize on behalf of my nation to what uh, our nation did to the Chinese. It so happened that the Japanese had killed this Chinese pastor's father and mother during the Second World War. And I'm telling you, when this happened, it just broke this place up. That's never happened before. It probably won't happen again. But I'm telling you, it was one of the most powerful things. And I thought, you know, God can't do anything different, but every time I think that, lo and behold, out of the clear blue, the Holy Spirit shows up and just does it differently. We're so happy you're here. Where are y'all from? Oh, man. I heard Texas. I heard Texas. Let me ask you this. How many, how many of y'all are from outside of uh, the southeastern part of the United States? My goodness. All up in the balcony. How many of you are from, from the Midwest? Well, bless your hearts. We're so happy you're here. I'll tell you, we're having a real influx of people from the Midwest into this revival. How about people from the West Coast? Do we have anyone here from the West Coast? Where? Over here? God bless you. What state? California. Great. Great. God bless you. How about the great Northwest? Where are you folks from? Montana. Praise God. Alaska. God bless you, sis. Amen. We're glad you're here. Praise God. Be blessed. Take this back up to the frozen north. <laughs> Praise God. Thaw that place out with the Spirit of God. Bless you. How many of you are here from outside of the continental United States? Those of you from outside the continental United States, would you stand up, please? Where are you from, brother? Hong Kong, a missionary to Hong Kong from Australia. And where are you from, brother? A missionary to Hong Kong from the Philippines. So Australia and the Philippines are interested in Hong Kong. God bless you folks. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where are you folks over here from? I think I know. Where? Toronto. All of you are from Toronto? God bless you richly. We're so happy you're with us tonight. Be blessed. Praise God. Praise God. Where are you folks from? Germany. Hallelujah. Step out here. God bless you, Pastor. It's so good to see you. Wife is Pastor. Oh, yeah, there's a pastor spouse. I see. Turn around and let these folks see you. This is the pastor. God bless you. Where in Germany are you from? Bavaria. 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 Praise God. Wonderful. We're so happy you're here. Thank you. Be blessed. 
be blessed. Did you come just for the revival? Good. Praise God. Praise God. That may seem strange to you, but uh, we had a person here in revival that paid $3,000 for a ticket to come to one service. One service. That's how hungry folks are. And uh, I'm telling you, folks, when people go after God like that, God goes after them. You're going to be touched, brother, sister. You are. Praise God. Where are you folks from? London, England. All of these folks. Praise God. Welcome. God bless you, my brother. God bless you, my brother, sister. I know where this fellow's from. Bring us greetings from your home nation. I'm from England. I'm from Holy Trinity, Brompton, from the church where Steve Hill first was ministered to, and this all started. Praise God. Praise God. Bless you, brother. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where are you folks right over here from? Germany. Do you know those folks down there? <laughs> pastor, uh, pa uh, pastor and husband down there wave at these folks. These are your countrymen. <laughs> See what they look like? You, you get them before you leave tonight. You'll have something to talk about. God bless you. Both of you are from Germany. Well, bless your hearts. We're so happy you're here. Where are you from, brother, sister? Germany! Wow! Bless you. Bless you. Well, we're so happy you're here wherever you're from. Uh, did I miss anyone else from outside the continental United States? Oh, there you are. Where are you from? New Zealand. God bless you. Praise God. Praise God. Over here, brother. Shout it out. Where are you from? Guy standing up there can't sit down. <laughs> Where? All right. Where are you from, sister? Tokyo, Japan? God bless you. God bless you. Folks, if we're reading this right, God is beginning to girdle the earth with the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. These are the most exciting times to be alive in the history of mankind, I believe. Praise God. Praise God. It's a joy now to have uh, our brother and sister Dick Rubin back with us. They've been away for a while. Praise God. Praise God. They're an integral part of the ministry team here at Brownsville, and, and when they're gone, or when any member of the team is gone, like Pastor's gone tonight, we miss we miss him so much, and we missed uh, uh, Brother Dick and uh, Deanna when they were away, and we're glad they're back. God bless you, partner. Amen. It's a privilege to be back, I'll tell you that. How many came to the prayer meeting last night? Was that awesome? Huh? That's why tonight is so wonderful. That's what we say. Come to the prayer meetings whenever you can every Tuesday night, because that's the time that everything is set in place, and we just, uh, we just know that it's so important. We'll talk to you about it later on this week. How, where are all the busloads? Now, it's supposed to be four busloads from Evansville. Where are they? Look at that. My goodness. Maybe y'all will get saved up there way once in a while. Anyway, welcome so very much. Wait, there were four busloads, right? Two, two, two charters and everybody else just hung in there, huh? Okay. Okay, we're going to take up an offering tonight. Surely you can do better than that. Come on, you can do better than that. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege, Lord God, of giving to your work. How many pastors do we have here tonight? Okay, I want you to consider something. You know, if you sow oranges, you're going to, or, or you sow tomatoes, you're going to reap what? Tomatoes. And I believe when you sow into this revival, your church does, you're going to reap a revival. I believe that because if God said like produces after like kind. And so we're going to offer all of you just a chance. We don't take up offerings here. We just offer you an opportunity to sow into fertile soil. This is some of the most fertile soil, I believe, at least in my, in my opinion, this is the most fertile soil that I know of anywhere in the world. A lot of wonderful ministries, but I'll tell you when, when you talk about 35,000 people, I'm going to say that again, 35,000 people in 13 months have come to the Lord. 
Some of you aren't very excited about that. You might have a loved one that needs to get saved. 35,000 people have been saved in 13 months. This is fertile soil. This is fertile soil. Give him praise. Give him glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the soul. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That's 35,000 heartaches of the enemy. <laughs> Every time somebody gets saved, the enemy gets pricked in his heart. I think Steve Hill and I got some little arrows. I don't know. He'll show them to you a little while, but I think he throws darts right in the center of Satan's heart. Every time one comes to the altar, take that one, devil. Here's another one. Take that one, devil. This is awesome soil to, to, to sow into, and we're going to give you an opportunity tonight to be part of what God is doing here. I just wanted to read a scripture when uh, uh, Chaplain Robertson asked me to take up the offering. I happen to think of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. He that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. And it goes on to say, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgivings to God for the administration of this service. And that's what you're sowing into for the administration of the service that's going on here. Ushers, if you'll come forward. And tonight, if you're visiting, please remember, no matter whether you're mad at your pastor or not, your tithe goes to your home church. Please repeat that. My tithe goes to my home church. Okay, remember that as you give tonight, and we thank you so much for your gifts. Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity to sow into rich, fertile soil. For truly, Lord God, in this soil, 35,000 people have been snatched out of the hands of hell. And Lord God, it's just the beginning. Bless those, Lord God, who have sown into this soil, those who have sown bountifully. Lord God, let them reap bountifully. Those who sow sparingly, let them reap sparingly. But Lord God, this is for the administration of this service of this revival. Thank you, Father, for the blessings that you poured out upon us. Pour your blessings now upon the people as they give. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you give tonight. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you. You can remain seated. Just sing with me. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Say thank you. to, uh, before we give you just about a five minute, ten minute break, um, we'll come back and sing one more song before Brother Steve comes to preach. Uh, it's good to have Tom Nolan here. Hi, Tom. I just met Tom tonight. Tom is the music director who paved the way for all this to happen. 
Amen. He was here. Good to have you, Tom. God bless you. Oh, fan club. It's, I wanted to say that, and Pastor will be here tomorrow night, and he'll probably say more about that, but I, I just wanted to say that because, you know, things in churches don't just happen. They're all attributed to who came before and seed that was sown, foundations that were laid, things that were done, and right now we're laying foundations. It's so wonderful to work in the kingdom of God because you never know exactly what you're laying foundation for or what you're doing. You just never know. You know, I mean, I sure didn't think that when I came here in April of 95, in, Ju in June of 95, revival was going to break. I thought I was moving to a sleepy southern town. And here's the world. I didn't expect that. And I don't know what the Lord has in the future. But I tell you what, it's going to be great. And we're all playing a part. And I just wanted to... I just wanted to honor him and, and just say thank you, Tom, for leading yeah. these people and preparing the way. I appreciate it so much. Good to have you here. Glory. I, I, I will say this. I, I've met Tom Nolan for the first time tonight, him and his wife, and um, it's the one thing that has been said about him repeatedly is what I hope is said about me when I'm gone. So he's a great Christian man. He's a great Christian man, and uh, that's, that, I mean, what else can be said? What else, is, what, what would you want more? Glory. How many has been here since two? Two this afternoon. Three. Four. Wow. God bless you. Well, I want to tell you what, we're not close to 12. Somebody said 12. <laughs> that was a wounded spirit back there going, 12. <laughs> <laughs> a wounded spirit, a sunburned head, right? <laughs> I tell you what, God will not disappoint you. If you've come hungry, it's the Lord you seek after, and He will meet your need. We want to give you just about 10 minutes break and let you just get a drink of water, use the restroom. We are far from over. And I want, again, tonight when we get to the end of the service, you need to move right in and receive prayer after the altar call is given. And after you get saved, get prayer. God bless you. Ten minutes. We'll be back.
for making the trip. down here is worth looking at, Lord, in the comparison of your beauty. We want to ride with you. Want to look upon your face. We're going to sing forever of the amazing grace of the Lord. When you say, come up higher, come up higher, come up higher. Oh, there's nothing in this world worth turning back for. Cause we know one day we're gonna see you
every once in a while I put in a request for a song and well, I just I haven't heard Benny play the harmonica in a long time. <laughs> And this is, um, I don't even know the name of her. What's the name of the song? You every morning. The harmonica song. The harmonica song. But uh, in just a minute, we're going to pray together, and then uh, I'll be sharing a message. And there's a, there's a lot of folks here that are away from God. You may be in the chapel. You may be in the uh, cafeteria or the choir room, and you're away from the Lord. We're going to give you the opportunity in just a few minutes to give your heart to Jesus. Now, we've had in this place, if, if you're here and you don't believe in God, uh, that's okay. All right? That's okay. If you're here and you believe in God, but you don't know him, that's okay. I don't want you to feel uh, that, that you have got to work anything up. We've had people come to these altars that were from cults. We've had every, every type of background you can imagine come to these altars. We've had people come to these altars that didn't know anything about Jesus, but they felt the Spirit of God drawing them. And they knew nothing. They had no evangelical background. But God is big. And he, he will do that work if you'll let him do it tonight. But before we preach the word tonight, let's, let's have this song new every morning. Thank you. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, that was the harmonica song. Let's pray everyone together. By the way, if, if you're a prayer worker, uh, we need you on the platform. So uh, come on up here now. We need you to go ahead and fill in these seats. Workers, move in if you would. We're going to need every available prayer worker tonight at these altars. So you can just go ahead and come on up right now. Hallelujah. Could I give you a word of encouragement as they're coming? When, when we open up the altars for prayer, there will be two altar calls tonight. The first one are for those that need to get right with the Lord. The second one is going to be a time for you to come and be prayed for. Just a blessing from the Lord. There's an anointing flowing. But if, if you are here and you're just here for one night, don't stand around and pray about being prayed for. Okay? And, and I'm, every night there's folks that, you know, just... You're just not sure you're going to watch for a while, okay? But you don't understand, there are thousands of people here tonight, and 95% of them want prayer. And they will step right in front of you, sis. They don't care. Hundreds and hundreds of teenagers from all around are going to be prayed for tonight. And they will, grandpa, grandma, or pastor, if you're, if you're wavering about whether or not to get prayer, they'll stomp right in front of you, man. I'm telling you the truth. They don't care about you. If you, get, you cop an attitude, they don't care. <laughs> they, if there's a slot, they're going to fill it. So um, be prayed for tonight. Let's pray this prayer tonight before we go any further. Everyone pray out loud. Those of you in the chapel, Richard, have these pray with me. Those in the cafeteria and the choir room, everyone pray this prayer. If you do not know God, I want you to pray this prayer. Everyone pray. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus. speak to my heart. Change my life. In your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Charity, come on up if you would. If I could um, just share a word with the pastors before we go any further. When revival breaks out in your church, and I'm certain it's going to. Do not try to control it. Now, Don Wilkerson was here just a few weeks ago. Don, and, and you know, has pastored uh, Times Square with Brother Dave for seven or eight years. And Don came and, and uh, was with us for several days. He's a dear friend and, and preached behind this pulpit one Sunday morning. And, and he said that was, that was the one thing in this revival that it just blew him off the map is that it was being pastored, but it was not being controlled. And there's a big difference. You can't, you can't control everything that moves, and you don't want to. And there are things, pastors, listen, there are, and I'm not coming as an authority. This is just some stuff we've learned. There are some things that do not look normal that turn out to be more normal than you'd ever believe, man. I'm talking about, you know, I've, I've had agnostics walk in this place. I'm talking about God-haters have come in here and, and have been, have they, maybe they've been standing five or ten feet away from you, and, and you, you look at them, and there's been times where we, a prayer worker or myself or one of the other pastors will just do this. You know, it's just, it just comes over us. Just, uh, you're, you're, it's like lightning hits you, and I've watched people be hit and thrown up against the wall, hit the wall, fall to the ground, and start shaking. Now, the man was just visiting. You know? As a matter of fact, he came down to the altar to find his wife so they could leave and go to Whataburger. And, he's, and he doesn't know God, doesn't believe in God. He's here to get his wife out of the revival. We've had things like this happen, friend, night after night. And so it looks unusual, but I want to tell you, in the spirit realm, it makes a whole lot of sense. Because God is getting a hold of people. I've told someone today that this is a violent revival. It is a violent revival. And Satan has, is mounting up a violent attack against our country, against our youth, against our culture. And it makes sense that the counterattack would be violent. And it's going to be, friend. It's going to be, friend. And we're watching God take in just a matter of seconds, grip, like these testimonies you've heard, grip young people that have been shackled and chained by satanic forces for years 
in a matter of seconds. No counseling, no drug rehab programs, and I believe in all that. But we're watching them in a matter of seconds be delivered. I have watched. We have the other day a girl that has a $6,000 a month coke habit was delivered right here. Friend, that, that is the power of God. And the greatest thing that we've seen here, greater than all the deliverances, and it's the greatest deliverance that I've been through, and I've, I've been delivered from drugs and alcoholism and a lot of junk, but the greatest deliverance that I've experienced uh, was when God delivered me from a critical spirit. And I want to encourage you, if you have a critical spirit, and, and those of you that have a critical spirit, it's already been working full time all day today. You know, why do we have to wait outside? Why don't they just let us in? You know? I mean, it's a, there's a million things. You know, you might, you might buy a tape and go, how come it's eight ninety nine, not seven ninety nine? How come you know what's where's this going? What's that? What's oh, why why do the ushers have mob coats? Why why are there reserved seats? And your critical spirit will analyze everything. I like that song. I don't like that song. I really don't like that song. I don't like his hair. <laughs> they don't sing enough old hymns. They, they sing too many old hymns. How come they don't have the words on a screen? I mean, friend, some of y'all have just been overtime. And by the time we get to the preaching, you're wore out. Just relax. Don't you think somebody's been thinking about that stuff? Don't you think since it's been going on for 14 months, don't you think there's a reason there's not the words on a screen? One of the main reasons, friend, is because people tend to worship that thing. And all their attention is on that screen so they can sing properly. And I'm not against screens. You didn't hear me say that. But they'll, they'll look at that, and, and all night long they're on those screens. Whereas we have found, without a screen, people tend to learn the song just like that. Those of you that are visiting for the first time, tomorrow night some of these same songs may be sung, and you'll be singing them. No screen, no words, your spirit. Pick them up. So if you have a critical spirit uh, about, about anything, about there may be somebody next to you, and I want to tell you, God planted that person there. If there's somebody next to you that's, that's doing this, you know? I promise you, that was God. He's just working on you, man. Just working on you. And rather than scoot away from them, you know, you need to nudge towards them. You know? So let God set you free from the critical spirit. And um, I tell you, I ain't got time for it anymore. I don't. And when it creeps up, and it'll come back. It's a bear, man. It'll come back at you. Just get, just get rid of it. And quit hanging around people. Quit hanging around people that all they do is cut everybody down. It doesn't take half a man to criticize. You know, and there's a lot of folks, if it wasn't for revival somewhere, they'd have nothing to cut down. You know, there's a lot of folks, they make their living off of revivals. You know, if, if, as long as God is moving somewhere, they can write books against it. Is anybody listening? There's, there's, always, there's always that camp out there, so just rid yourself from it and say, God, I just want a, a pure move in my life. I don't want to get involved in all this junk. And I'm going to go ahead and, um, and, and do something that, that, um, that I have, uh, have I've spoken on a couple times in this revival, but uh, the last few weeks the Lord has really been dealing with me about covering this area before I preach. And I preached in here, um, I guess it's a month ago, on white cane religion. And uh, white cane religion, uh, my text was when Jesus said, can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a ditch? And one night, I believe it was a Thursday night, I preached on, can the blind lead the blind? And the next night I preached on, there is a ditch. And I talked about the ditch, and the ditch being the hole called hell, and uh, the danger of, of, of who's leading you. And I spoke to the congregation about this, about make sure the one you're following, everybody's following somebody, make sure the one you're following knows where they're going. Okay? This is so important. And uh, we don't claim to have all the answers 
here at this revival, but we are in tune with the heartbeat of the Lord. We know that this is the Lord moving. And uh, I just want to warn you, Charlie, if you'd go ahead and help me out. I, I just want to let you know that in all the great moves of God in years gone by, pastors, listen, please. Everyone in the chapel, in the overflow rooms, I want you to listen up. And every, history is repeating itself. Every time there's a move of God, there will be a counterattack. And that attack usually comes from within the church. Okay, and it'll come strong. Before this millennium's up, there's going to be several books out by major publishers. And some of the names of the authors you will recognize. And they're going to come out, they will blast everything that's going on inside your church. Especially if people are getting saved. They will say things like they're really not getting saved. Okay? But they're going to blast, expect it, Pastor. And what God is going to do with some of you is he's going to build some backbone in you to where you can stand up to the criticism and, and just stand rather than, 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 than going belly up and going, I can't, you know, I can't handle the pressure. But in every great move of God, there has been counterattacks. And I just want to share a couple with you. Jesus said, can the blind lead the blind? The answer is no, they can't. When Azusa Street broke out in California back at the turn of this century, that, how many believe that was a move of God? Most people today would say that was a move of God. But as that was going on, as it was going on, it was an irritant to a lot of people. One of those individuals was G. Campbell Morgan. If you pastors, I'm sure you may have his books in your library. I have several of his books in my library, and I, I love them dearly. G. Campbell Morgan was a man of God. I believe he's going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I believe we're all going to be together one day. But G. Campbell Morgan said this about the Azusa Street revival. He came out publicly and said this, that Azusa Street and all that's taking place at 312 Azusa in Los Angeles, California, the words of William Seymour, the people that are flocking from all over the nation are experiencing the last vomit of Satan. Those are his exact words. I'm not preaching against G. Campbell Morgan. I'm speaking his words. Pastor, you say something, people are free to quote you. You write it in a book, it's open game, friend. It's the last vomit of Satan. I want to tell you, as much as that man loved the Lord, he missed God. Be careful who you're watching. Be careful who you're listening to. Just because it's in print doesn't mean it's the truth. And some of you here, and I'm, I'm, I, I feel that the Lord wants me to say this, some of you here are so spineless. You are, you're, you're, you're so gutless. And you're going to experience a move of God in your life tonight. God is going to move mightily. But within a couple days, someone's going to come against you. And it may be at a diner somewhere. It may be at your church. And they're going to say something like, you're going to say, yes, the Spirit of the Lord came all over me. I was refreshed or, or this happened or that happened. And they're going, to, they're going to talk you right out of your experience. They are. They're going to say things like, and you're going to say, well, man, the power of God came over me and my, my, my body just, I felt like electricity was shooting through me. By the way, if that happens, you've had the same experience as Charles Finney. Charles Finney, the great evangelist, had that same experience. Read it in his journal. Waves of electricity shot through his body. Wave after wave after wave. The power of God shot through that man. You, some will experience that tonight. It happens every single night. I welcome it, Jesus. It's happened to me. I welcome it, Lord. But you will have people that say, that's not God. That's not God. Show me in the scripture where waves are going to shoot through you like that. One man came up to me with two pages, front and back, off his computer, where people fell forward, fell backwards, fell over, you know. And, and he said, Steve, it's all in the Word. And I looked at that and I said, I don't need that for manifestations. I need that for the blood, salvation, the, uh, for baptism, the teachings of Jesus. But if my right hand shakes like this, I'm sorry, friends, I don't have to run to the Bible. I'm so, you, you, can, you, can, you can throw a stick at me, throw your cane at me if you want to, but I don't have to run to the Bible with my right hand shakes and find a scripture, right? Right hand, thine right hand shall shake. 
That's not the point, friend. What is happening after your right hand shakes? That's what I want to know. Another man came up. Another man came up and said, man, did you read in Jeremiah, I believe it's chapter 23, where Jeremiah was as a drunken man. All his bones were out of joint and he, was, he stumbled as a drunken man. It's a wonderful scripture, friend, but we don't preach on it here. It's fabulous. I don't need those scriptures, friends. If, I, if, if I'm standing in the presence of the Lord and his spirit comes over me and I can't stand and I fall to the ground it's because God's spirit came over me. I can't stand and I fall to the ground. You don't have to run up to me and show me 52 scriptures. Because that's not what it's all about. That is, and, and some of you are missing it because of some little manifestation. Don't major on minors. You look at the Word of God. You look at Pentecost. Look at Pentecost. What happened at the day of Pentecost? The power came down. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. They saw tongues of fire. They were drunk. They, they must have looked drunk, friend, because people said they looked drunk. What do you think every one of them individually was experiencing? They could have put, the, the book of Acts could be a foot thick with all the experiences each one of those people was going through. But did God write about that? No, he didn't. What did Peter preach on? Salvation, repentance. So I'm just, uh, if you want to major on minors, you can, friend. But that's not what I'm after. I'm after the real thing. I'm after the changed lives. And I love the manifestations, don't get me wrong. Tonight, half this crowd the Spirit of the Lord's going to come over you in a way you've never experienced before. You need to welcome it. R.A. Torrey said this about the Azusa Street Revival. It's a great Bible expositor. I have his books in my library. But he missed Azusa Street. He said it is emphatically not of God. A.J. Ironside, one of the greatest preachers of this decade, said it is disgusting, delusions, insanities, exhibitions worthy of a madhouse. He missed Azusa, and there will be people that miss the end time awakening. They'll miss it. They will miss it. I'm not on some soapbox, friend. The Lord has spoken to me to warn you, just to warn you. Just because a man of God was right 30 years ago doesn't mean he's going to be right today. Matter of fact, that's one of the greatest dangers. The people that are right 30 years ago uh, because they're not experiencing something fresh today lean on 30 years ago. They tend to lean on the experience of you know, 30 years ago, and they say, well, that was God. This couldn't be God. That was God. Stay away from it. I'm warning you, friend. God's doing a fresh thing. He's moving. They said of George Whitfield, the church leaders in Georgia, the state that borders us, said this, it is mere enthusiasm. It's fanaticism, an abuse of grace. The church leaders spoke against George Whitfield. He is abusing God's grace. They said Whitfield's ministry is parallel with the Duterte family of South Carolina. For those of you that are church historians, the South, that family from South Carolina were notorious for incest and murder. They compared George Whitfield to a family that was committing incest and murder. It came out in the papers. The church leaders. I wonder how many were not saved because they read the paper. They were going to go to George Whitfield's meetings and hear about the blood and hear about the cross and hear about Jesus. But somebody, somebody stuck in the mud of religion said something negative about them and kept those dear souls from the cross. Watch out who you're listening to. I'm warning you, friend, history is repeating itself. They said about D.L. Moody, they said that he should realize the limitations of his vocation and not attempt to speak in public. The local pastors in England, God bless you brethren from England, but you know D.L. Moody caught a lot of flack in that country. The local pastors put up signs on the walls that said D.L. Moody's ministry will bring probable evil results. Stay away. It's a parade of human conceit. D.L. Moody, give me a break. D.L. Moody was a countryman full of the Holy Ghost. Give me a break. Probable evil results. He was driving evil out of England, not bringing it in, friend. Watch who you're listening to.
Be careful who you're listening to. Watch out who you're listening to, friend. And young people, make sure the person you're dating knows where they're going. Man, I could stay on that. Well, hallelujah. Mm. Turn with me to Mark chapter 10. By the way, for those of you that do not understand how I can stand behind this pulpit and mention those names of those great men, let me tell you something, friend. A.J. Ironside, R.A. Torrey, G. Campbell Morgan, we're going to all be together at the marriage supper. And I want to tell you, they already know they missed it. All right? Seymour's up there. He's not a one-eyed black man no more. He's got full sight. And they're probably sitting across the table from one another at the marriage supper of the Lamb, waiting on us. They're already talked it out. And he's probably already apologized. So I'm not saying that, you know, that, that it's, they're, they're going to hell for it. I'm saying be careful. Be careful. Don't misquote me. I want to tell you something about misquoting us too. Everybody look at me. It's on tape. This entire revival, if you said I said something, I'll take you to the place. It'll take you something like four solid months just to watch, I think it's five months now, to watch 24 hours a day all this revival. You can see everything is on tape. Every word that's been said, every manifestation, every testimony, every baptism, everything. If somebody said, I saw the pastor fall out of his seat and roll down those steps and act like a dog on the floor, you give me the date, we'll show you the film. If it ain't there, you're a liar. It's all on tape, so careful, careful. Mark chapter 10. I'd like to read a text, a portion of Scripture that I, I love dearly. It's a story that I've preached on before. But for the last five days, this has been burning in my heart, so I'm going to obey the Lord. Verse 46 of Mark chapter 10. And they came to Jericho. And as he was going out from Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. Richard, how you doing over there, brother? Another Richard answered me. How you doing, Richard? How's everybody? God bless y'all. Y'all listen to the word. Speaking to the folks in the chapel. Verse 47. And when he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage, arise, he is calling for you. And casting aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus said, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and began following him on the road. Now there's all kinds of people in this room. Stay with me for the next few minutes. I'm not going to preach long. I know what the Lord wants me to do tonight. I will obey God. And you need to listen. And I want to tell you what I'm, I'm going to do if you start dozing. Where's that microphone? Charity's got, stand up with that microphone. Charity's got a microphone. See that right there? It's called a wireless. Say that with me. Wireless. That means it has no wire. Okay? Now, if you start dozing off, if someone next to you starts going to sleep because they've had a big day, long day, hard day, long drive, I know there's folks here have driven 18 hours and you just pulled up to the church. If someone is next to you and they start to doze off, don't say a thing. Don't wake them up. Just raise your hand like that. I know what's going on because it's the middle of the service. You don't want to get saved. You're, you're, you're calling on your friend over here. So just raise your hand, and I will continue to preach, okay? I'll continue to preach, and I'll say something like, and the Lord did this, and the Lord did that, and he did this, because they're not listening anyhow. They're going to sleep. And I'll just talk, and, and because that's music to their ears, you know, as long as they hear the preaching, you know? As long as they hear the preaching, they're going to be all right. And so I'm going to keep on talking like this and I'll with the top of my voice and I'll get right up to him with that microphone. 
and Benny's at the controls, and he'll turn that wide open and stick it right in your nose. And friend, let me tell you what'll happen. You'll wake yourself up, you'll hear your snore through this PA system, and when you open your eyes, about 5,000 people will be staring at you. <laughs> and also, we have one, two, three television cameras in this room. They'll be on you, too, so you'll be nationwide. <laughs> so what I would do, I'd stay up for the next few minutes. You need to hear the word. There's all kinds of people in this room. There's four category, categories of people. There are people who are close to the truth. These are the people that are, that are close but not in yet. You're going after God, but you're not saved yet, okay? You're like the Ethiopian eunuch that was coming back from Jerusalem, and Philip came up beside him, got in his carriage, and the man was reading from the book of Isaiah. He was close to the truth, but he did not know the truth. There are some of you in this room, you are good church folks, but you don't know Jesus. You listening? You're good. You're a wonderful person. How many times have I heard in my life, he's a good man. God would never damn him to hell. He's a good man. Has anybody ever heard that? They're such a good family. But they belong to a cult. But you sit there and go, but they're such a good family. They're so morally clean. They're going to go to hell, friend. They don't know the truth. There are people that are close, but they're not in. That's one type of person. There are people here who are distant from the truth. Some of you have no idea who God is. You have no inkling of what he can do for you if it even does exist. You are distant from the truth. God's brought you here tonight. Everyone is here under divine appointment. We've had the other night a warlock came to the Lord in this place. And I promise you, these people come here. A warlock is a male witch. People come here and they're distant from the truth. Mike, the guitarist, he just testified a few minutes ago. He came in here and he said, baby, I'll give you one hour. He was distant from the truth when he came into this building. He was far from the truth when he came in here and sat down. But he got up around 12, 30, 1 o'clock. Things changed. Things changed. Then we also have in this place people who have known the truth but have backslid. Some of you in the choir room tonight may be like that. You've known the truth at one time in your life, but you've backslid. By the way, in this revival, we do not rededicate our lives to Jesus. There's only two categories when you come to this altar. One is being saved for the first time. You're being saved. The second one is backslidden. Okay? There's a hush in this place when I say that. You want to know why? You want to know what rededication is? And pastors, if you're using it, I have no problem with it at all. Don't get me wrong. In this revival, what I've noticed is people will come forward. Okay? They, they've known the Lord. They're 37 years old. They knew the Lord, met the Lord when they were 22, lived for God for a couple years. Okay? And then started in some sexual sin, okay? Been away from God basically about 15 years, okay? They come forward to rededicate themselves to God. And one man, I talked to him, I said, what are you doing tonight? He goes, I'm rededicating myself to God. And I said, well, what have you been involved in? He said, um, hardcore pornography. I'm a, I'm a, I drink. I've been involved in drugs. My family's destroyed. I said, sounds like you're a backslider, man. Sounds like sin. Does that sound like sin to anybody in here but me? <laughs> sounds like sin. And it's not like you just, okay, Jesus, I'm joining the club again. <laughs> Lucky you, God, here I come. No, friend, it's called backslidden, a backslidden condition. You slid away from God. The Bible talks about the backslider. So tonight, if you're away from Jesus, you're backslid. You need to come to God tonight. And then there's another group of people, and those are the ones who know the truth and have been set free and live in victory. There's a few of you here. Hallelujah. We preach all kinds of messages in this revival. I've preached on judgment 
And before this week's up, I'm sure I'll be preaching a judgment message. We preach on love. We preach on mercy. We preach on uh, from Genesis to Revelation. But tonight, I'm going to talk to you about the Lord's attention. And this man right here, Bartimaeus, was a man who got something from God, and everyone within the sound of my voice need to learn a lesson from this blind man who received his sight. I'm just going to share with you a few points on how to get the Lord's attention tonight. How for the Lord to look at you. You pay attention to this, friend. This is for every single person that I just named. If you've never known the Lord, this is for you. If you've, if you've known the Lord and you're backslid, this is for you. How many would like the Lord's attention tonight? How, would, how many would like God to look at you? Dear God, Jesus, I've come 18 hours from Michigan. I want the Lord to pay attention to me. Listen to these points. The first thing is you've got to recognize. Recognize tonight that you have a need. Recognize. If you're taking notes, you write that down. Recognize that you have a need. That is the first point in this message. Friend, for you to receive something from God, you have first have to recognize that you need something from God. Joseph Carroll said years ago, according to the weight of the burden that grieves you is the cry to God that comes from you. According to the weight of the burden that grieves you. Don't let me lose you on this, friend. This is easy. According to the weight of the burden that grieves you is the cry to God that comes from you. In layman's terms, if something's really bugging you, you'll do something about it. You must first recognize that you have a need. You have recognized tonight. You have to recognize if you're a hypocrite, you have to recognize that you're wearing a mask. I speak about the religious person. If you're a religious person, you have got to recognize that that's what you are, that it's all a facade. You look right, walk right, smell right, talk right, pay your tithes, pay your dues, sing the songs, but you don't know God. You've got to recognize that, friend. I'm talking about numero uno, huh? This is the first point to receive something from God. I've led a lot of gang members to the Lord in this, this church. And that's the first thing that a gang member has got to realize. And, and a, a young person that's always involved in, in fighting and, and uh, terrifying the neighborhood and, and uh, causing others to, to fear them. You've got to come in here, friend, and realize that you aren't number one, that you are destitute. You are a man that needs something from God. You've got to recognize that. I remember I was speaking at a high school. And uh, it was a, during the middle of the day, and there was about 900 students. They gave me all the juniors and seniors, and this is a secular school. And they had me speak to all these kids. And if you've ever done a high school rally, they're not easy. In the middle of the day, with no band, you know. I didn't have Petra backing me up, you know. I'm there all by my lonesome. It wasn't Carmen, then Steve. It was just, would you welcome... Steve, and you're just standing there, and 900 students are staring at you. And, and I love to speak to young people. I love to speak to t the teens and the students. And I began to speak and share my story. And some were listening, but it was the middle of the day, and there was a real goofy spirit there, you know, how, how young people will be. You, you're goofs a lot, you know, and you get together, and you're just groups of goofs when you're together, and, and just love to goof. And so people were sort of goofing. And I noticed a group of goofs off to the left-hand side. They were all huddled together, about 20 of them. It was obvious a team, like a basketball team, okay? And I saw them all sitting together. And there was a, it's not hard for me to detect in a heartbeat, you know, I can detect the leader of a group, okay? Because all the other little sheepies, <laughs> everything he does, they do, okay? And I looked over there, and I saw, I saw in the center of this group, this man, and when he laughed, they laughed. You know, if he went like this, they went like this. Whatever he did, they did. So um, I walked over to him, students, and um, got off the platform, and I, I have a strong voice. I put the microphone down, walked right up to him, and, uh, and stared him straight in the face. And he was a big man. He could have plastered me right there in front of everybody. And I said, well, who are you? And uh, the whole 
place just, I mean, it erupted for a second, then it just got hush because it was a confrontation between the preacher. This is a secular school now and one of the top kids in school. And I said, I said, is this your group? Do they follow you everywhere you go? <laughs> and I turned to the person next to him, and I was being serious, but also in a way that just sort of took him off guard. And I said, and I turned to the person next to him, another sort of big guy, you know, next to him, I said, is he your mama? <laughs> Do you? Does he take you to the bathroom? Does, does he help you think? Does he make all your decisions for you? you when he laughs, you laugh. <laughs> and by that time, friend, it was serious in that place. The guy was going, you could tell, you know, it, it had gotten to him, okay? And then I stopped right there, and I said, and, and I knew I had to take control of the whole place. I'm talking about point number one, recognize that you have a need. I looked at him, and I said, I'm going to tell you something right now in front of 900 students. You are not who you say you are, and you are not who you appear to be. You are one of the most miserable people in this school. You're handsome. You have it all together. You're a star athlete. I can tell that. But when you go home and you shut that door, and you're by yourself in your bedroom, you have cried yourself to sleep at night. I want to tell you something else. You're sick and tired of all these guys following you everywhere you go because you know you don't have it together. And I want to tell you something else. There's heartache in your home right now. The Spirit of the Lord was speaking to me. Guess what he did? He burst out crying. Just burst out. In front of 900 students, started squalling like a baby. And I said, am I telling you the truth? I'm telling you, friend, recognize that you have a need. Is anybody listening? Would you shake the front? Would you shake off the front, knock off the mask, and recognize that you have a need? About that time, another girl started laughing off to the right-hand side, and I looked at her, and she was a beautiful gal in school. You could tell she was probably on the cheerleading squad or, or one of the most popular kids in school. And I looked at her, and I said, and what are you laughing at? And she shut up, and I said, well, aren't you cute? You're gorgeous, man. I bet you're a little tired of it, too. How long does it take you to get ready in the morning? An hour, two hours? Why? Why does it take you that long? So guys can gawk at you all day? Aren't you tired of all the animals around you? Aren't you tired of them slobbering all over you all day long? Wouldn't you like to come to school and just be you? She started to cry. See, the mask started to come on. And I, right then, man, I just stopped. And I looked at the principal. And the principal looked at me like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I can't tell you about Jesus in this place because it's against the rules. <laughs> Then I said, and I can't tell you that if you ask him into your life, he'll change your life totally <laughs> because it's against the law. And if I told you that Jesus Christ has radically changed my life and I'll never be the same again, he's delivered me from drugs, all kinds of habits, if I told you that, they'd probably kick me out of this school. So I can't tell you that. <laughs> and I can't give you, and the principal was standing there going, the principal. And I said, and I can't give an altar call in this place because we're in the middle of a school day. But every one of you that want to change, I want you to come down here right now. <laughs> it was awesome. And I've never given an altar call in the middle of the day where you couldn't pray with them. And there are all these students where they're squalling and bawling like babies, okay? Just God had touched them. Okay? They recognize that they had a need. Is anybody listening, friend? That's the bottom line to receiving a miracle. They had all come forward, and then I thought, I can't pray with these folks. It was weird. So I looked at all these folks, and about that time, boy, God always provides. This little girl comes up. She hands me this slip of paper, and I open it up. She said, it's against the law for you to pray with them and lead them to Jesus because you're a visiting preacher, but it's not against the law for me. I'm a student, and I can do it. <laughs> 
Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So you got to recognize. And she proceeded to do just that very thing. You've got to recognize that you have a need. Let me, let me, let, blind Bartimaeus was? That's good. He had a need, friend. You have to recognize that you have a need. Those of you that are away from God tonight, do you recognize your depraved condition? Those of you that are backslid, do you recognize that you have a need? Or are you, so, are you, are you off on left field somewhere? Are you, are you in the ozone somewhere? Do you not recognize how bad off you really are? Some of you in this room, listen to me, that are doing well, you don't know God, but you're doing well. Your business is on the climb. Things are going well. You just got yourself a new car, paid it off. You paid cash. You got a new home. Things are working out well. We have a lot of you saved in this revival. Let me tell you why. Here's what Satan is doing with you. See, as a farmer, and I could have any farmer testify to this, a farmer that raises animals, especially a pig farmer. You know what a pig farmer will do when he's about to kill a, a pig? He'll separate it from the rest of them and he'll put it in his own little pen. And he'll put that little hog in that pen, and he'll feed him all the delicacies, man. He'll give him all the corn. Am I telling the truth, man? He'll fatten him up, okay? And that, that, that pig will sit there and go, and he'll be looking over at all the other pigs and going, man, this farmer loves me. Farmer loves me. Farmer loves me. I'm the head pig. I'm, I want to tell you something, friend. <laughs> You're going to be singing a different song in a few days. Oscar Meyer's on its way, man. But that's how Satan is. He came to steal, to kill, and destroy. He'll raise you up, man. He'll push you all the way up the ladder, and when you get up the top, he'll go, Doop. down you go. He'll fatten you up, and just when he's got you all bloated, all fat, he'll slice your life up. I'm telling you the truth. How many young people have I buried? I've buried many a young people that were just like that, doing great, dealing drugs, partying hard. He had everything they had going for him, and here they are in the morgue, you know? How many businessmen? Same way. Everything going for them. Then they realize one day, their family's destroyed, their kids are on drugs, the whole thing. Satan has fattened you all up, given you all these things, and you say, well, it's all blessings from God. Not necessarily, friend. He's given you an intelligent mind, many of you, and you've gotten a lot of what you've got because you've got know-how. You've got know-how. You better make sure what you're talking about when you say this is the blessings of God. You may get to heaven one day if you make it, and God say, I had nothing to do with that. I had, that was all your hard work. You burned the midnight oil to make that money. I was trying to get you in church. I was trying to get you on fire. I was trying to make an evangelist out of you, but no, 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 no. You want to own the biggest car lot in town. I'm sidetracking. <laughs> That's all right. Recognize that you have a need. The Bible says in Revelation 3.17, because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Leonard Ravenhill used to say the main reason we don't have revival in our churches is because we are content to live without it. We don't recognize how bad off we are. Well, the other points will go quicker. Number two, we're learning from Bartimaeus. Remember, he was blind. The next point is tonight, friend, if you want to receive from the Lord, if you want to get his attention, first you recognize that you have a need. The second thing you do is you go after him. You go after him alone. You're taking notes, you underline that word, alone. I mean pursue him with all your heart. Coming to Jesus is not the buddy system. You come to Jesus the way you came into this earth, one at a time. Naked you came in, naked you return, friend. You came in alone, you will stand before God alone. You come to Jesus alone. Let's look at this scripture again. And they came to Jericho, verse 46, and as he was going out from Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, 
the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road with his family and friends and all the other blind beggars, and the entourage was gathered around him. It ain't there, friend. He was alone. Blind Bartimaeus was alone. You go after God alone. Remember the man Zacchaeus up in the sycamore tree with all his friends? No, friend, he was the only monkey up there. He was the only one up there, friend. Zacchaeus received the blessing. He went after Jesus alone. Remember the woman with the issue of blood. Remember Nicodemus and all his priestly friends that snuck out at night to went to Jesus? No, sir, it's not in there. Nicodemus went after Jesus alone. David Wilkerson used to say to us all the time, if you'll get serious with God, he'll get serious with you. If you'll go after him, he'll go after you, friend. If you bless God, he will bless you. If you honor God, he will honor you. If you go after God, he will go after you, but you've got to go after him alone. Pay attention, friend, because tonight I'm going to give this altar call. Everyone listen up. This is a nice message, by the way. Isn't it? I'm not saying it's a good message. I'm saying it's nice. Okay, this is kind. This is a kind message. This is like a... a uh, the little Debbie snack and cake, okay? <laughs> this is a kind message. This is not Brussels sprouts. I'm trying to help you, friend. You go after God alone. I'm going to give an altar call in just a few minutes. When I do this, those of you that are away from God, you don't need your mama to come with you. You don't need your boyfriend to come with you. If you want Jesus Christ to wash your sins away, you get up and come down here and get your sins washed away. You don't need somebody to come with you. You go after God alone. Bartimaeus went after God alone. The third point is when he turns towards you, when Jesus turns towards you, make it count. I'm going to stay on this just for a minute. We're going to close. But look at me, folks. Look what happened here in this scripture. Verse 47, and when he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. This is Bartimaeus going after Jesus alone. Say that with me, alone. And many were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped. Three of the most precious words in the Bible. And Jesus stopped and said, call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage, arise, he is calling for you. And casting aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. Now, I know there's a ton of stuff here, pastors, for those of you that have preached on this, but I'm not preaching on the ton of stuff you preached on. I'm preaching on the ton of stuff that I'm preaching on. Verse 50, And casting aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus said, What do you want me to do for you? Tonight, friend, look this way. Tonight the Lord is asking that very same question. He is going to minister to you tonight. But look at me, folks. If you come down to this altar and you want Jesus Christ to change your life, but you are an adulterer, get your priorities right, friend. What is the problem in your life? What is the number one problem in your life? What is bugging you? Blind Bartimaeus had a lot of problems. Listen, when I came to Jesus, I was a drug addict. My family was destroyed. My life was in chaos. I was wanted by the law. I had problems coming out my ears, friends. I was physically addicted, mentally addicted. All my friends were on drugs. I had many, many problems, but those were not the issue. The issue was I did not know the Lord. Blind Bartimaeus had all kinds of problems. He was poor. He was begging friends. He probably had shabby clothing. He probably had no place decent to lay his head. He could probably use a good hot meal. He probably didn't have no money in his pocket or any money in the bank. There could have been a thousand things, probably ostracized from most of the public. Maybe his social life was all washed up. I'm sure it was. But when Jesus turned and looked at him and said, what do you want me to do for you, blind Bartimaeus? He did not say, 
Look at these clothes. Could you, Jesus, not, day after day I'm out of here in these rags. Look, they're, they're, they stink. I can smell them, Jesus. They stink. I don't even have two sets of clothes, Jesus. Could you give me some clothes? Lord, I don't have a place to lay my head. I need a, a four-room house with a roof on it. That's all I need. He didn't say that, friend. He didn't say, listen to this. That's right, Jesus, you don't hear nothing. Want to know why? There ain't nothing in there. I'm broke. I'm broke, Jesus, and I need some money. No, friend. When he turns towards you, make it count. Tonight, Jesus is turning towards you in that pew. He's turning towards you in the chapel. He's turning towards you in the cafeteria and in the choir room and at home. He's turning to you and he's saying, what do you want me to do for you? And if you are away from God, don't you dare tonight say, Jesus, could you just fix my business? You're a snot, friend. What parent, what parent would listen to that kind of junk from his son if his son was rebellious, his son was this, his son was that, and he just constantly just rebelling, not obeying his parents, not doing anything his parents told him to do, and then his bicycle breaks down. The bottom line is the kid needs to get right. He needs to get right. He needs to get on his hands and knees and, and ask mommy and daddy to forgive him. But there's a, a lull in the arguments or something at home, and the kid comes up and he says, Daddy, would you fix my bike? That's really the problem. That's what you sound like, friend. No, the bike ain't the problem. Your rebellion is the problem, friend. Some of you are asking God to fix your bicycle. And he's looking at you and he's saying, I gave you that bicycle. I gave you the legs to ride that bicycle. I gave you the breath to breathe so you could pedal. Your legs could move and pedal the pedals that makes that bicycle go down the road. I'm the one that put you in your mama's womb 27 years ago. I'm the one that gave breath. And who do you think made you choke when the, when the doctor patted you on the rear end? Who do you think that caused you to cough? Why do you think you cried out? That was me. I was putting breath in your lungs, kid. That was me. Do you understand? The problem is you need to repent. Businessman tonight, I'm speaking to some businessmen. Listen to me. Don't come to Jesus tonight and say, man, I got all these problems. Here's what you do. You're like a car, a car dealer. And you go, I tell you what, Jesus, it's good to have you with me. I'll give you three of these. Give me two of those. That's what you do, friend. Happens every Sunday, pastors, in our church. Every Sunday in our church is wheeling, dealing with God. I want to tell you, he ain't at the table. Never was, never will be. If you fix this, God, I'll fix that. Uh-uh, friend. Uh-uh. No. Just lay him on the table and say, God, I'm a wipeout. I am a wreck. My life's in shambles. And my biggest problem is not my marriage. It's not my attitude. It's not this. It's not that. I am empty inside, Jesus. I don't know you. I don't know you as my Savior. I am void inside. I don't have a personal relationship with you, Jesus. And because of that, my business in a shambles. My marriage is in shambles. My kids don't respect me. That's the bottom line, friend. Do you hear what I'm saying tonight? When he turns towards you, make it count. Blind Bartimaeus looked up at Jesus and he said, Lord, that I might regain my sight. The nail on the head, friend. I want to see. He knew if he could see, he could work. He could build his house. His social life would come back together. If you'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things will be added unto you, friend. I'm sharing the truth with you, friend. I'm telling you, this is a nice message. I'm being kind. I'm telling you how to get the Lord's attention tonight. Recognize that you have a need. You go after him alone. Third thing is when he turns towards you, make it count. Now, he's going to turn towards you in just a minute. I'm going to give this altar call. And those of you that don't know the Lord, this is your time to come down here and meet Jesus. Okay? But you don't come down here with some type of preconceived ideas of what's going to happen. 
You come down here just naked before the Lord. You say, Jesus, here I am. Here I am. I need you in my life. I got a void in my heart. And I'm, there's nothing can fill this void but you, Jesus. You recognize that you have that need, friend. The last point tonight is I love it. You can go and do his will. Go and do his will. Go and sin no more. Blind Bartimaeus, Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and began following who? Jesus on the road. Look at me, everyone. We're going to close. But when Jesus Christ changes your life tonight, you go after him. You follow Jesus. See, this is discipleship. A disciple is a loyal, learning follower. You take this from blind Bartimaeus. Jesus said, go your way. And he goes, uh-uh, I'm going your way. I'm going your way. Young people, you bless my heart. You bless my heart. How many, how many, young, how many folks 25 and under do we have in this room? Stand up right now. Stand up. <laughs> Stay standing. In the chapel. In the chapel. In the choir room, in the cafeteria, I want you to stand. This is a great representation for a Wednesday night. This is awesome. I want to tell you something, young people. You come to Jesus. Let him work that miracle in your life, and then you follow him. You follow him. You take it from blind Bartimaeus. You follow the Lord. This is not, su this is not just a... a, a uh, a passing thing that happens in your life. This is life. This is forever. This is eternal. You follow the Lord. Tonight, some of you are going to come down here and give your hearts to Jesus. You do that, friend. And then after that, you determine in your heart, listen to me in the chapel, you determine in your heart to follow the Lord. See, the school season is coming up. When does school start here? In two weeks? Three weeks? The 19th. The 12th? This is going to be the greatest school year in this century. Don't sit down yet. So I'm going to tell you, your true test, young people, is going to come when school cranks up. Some of you are going off to college. Others of you are standing, you're out of school, but you're still experiencing the pressure of youth, of being young. People are trying to figure out what you're made of. Young people, I want to challenge you. Sister, come on up here. Come on, yeah. You too. Come on up. Yep, you. Come on up here, sis. Come on up. How old are you? 20. How old are you? 18. How do you, sis? 14. Where do you go to school? Washington. Washington High School. That's not a Christian school, is it? A lot of heathen there, aren't they? I want to tell you something. If you start shaking like that in the school, <laughs> you already have. <laughs> you better get used to it, friends. The principal's been calling us all last year. I just want, I, I, I guess I'm just putting you up here for display. I just, people, young people, look, I want you to get ready. The Spirit of God to start moving. Young man, back there that's shaking. Come on up here, brother. Come on up here. I want to tell you when the test is going to come. Where are you at? Yeah. Both of you, man. Well, hurry. <laughs> now, those of you, yeah. Where are you from, man? Panama, that Panama City. Yep. Lord, have mercy. Where are you from, guy? Where are you from? You're from Arkansas? Yeah. 
Now, I want to tell you what this is about. This is about changed lives. That's what this is about. But let me tell you why the manifestations are hitting our young people. First, I told you it's a violent revival. It's going to be violent. They go to school, and they're in, they're in algebra, okay? They're in algebra, and some of them, without even thinking about it, the Spirit of the Lord just goes, now, and they'll start. <laughs> and the teacher, this has already happened, friend, the teacher will go, Judy, are you all right? <laughs> and Judy will go, um, fine. <laughs> What's happening to you, Judy? The Spirit of the Lord is on me. And listen, I'm talking about young people and talking about following the Lord. I'm sticking with this point. We're going to close in just a second. But here's what happens. See, the pressure's on now. You're not in church. You're at school. Everybody's looking at you. And you just said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. If you'll hold your ground, you'll hold your ground. Because see, it's not you. It's the Spirit of the Lord. You watch what's going to happen. You're going to be there and... This is, what, this is what's going to happen in this upcoming year. It's already happened this last year, but we're going to see an increase like, Lord, just pour it on. But we're going to... You're going to see classes disrupted, and revival spreads like wildfire. It spreads like fire. And the very people in class that are hard as rock spiritually, are going to look at that and go, I like that. <laughs> There's something to that. See, they've already seen your holy life. They're going to go, now, you know, because they, they teach about power all the time, you know. Church all talking about power. They're going, well, where is it, Pastor? Where is the power to deliver me from drugs? Where is it? I mean, I smoke three packs a day. Where is the power to deliver me? He smoked two packs a day, and he hasn't smoked in three months. And he's shaking. Is anybody listening? They're going to start some up here. Y'all go ahead and sit down. <laughs> Don't sit down yet, students. Okay? Those of you 25 and, and, and under, stay, stay standing just for a minute. But this is, when, this is when the rubber beats the road, when the, the, when the fire comes down and everybody's looking at you. The power of God's coming down. If you'll hold your ground, this is the Spirit of the Lord on me. It's not, it's not shaking. God is trying to use some type of avenue to get the attention of America. And this works. He used it on Saul of Tarsus, and it worked well. It worked very well, friend. It was instantaneous. And he's using it today. And here's what's happened. These kids, one young girl was carried out of a class in a wheelchair by the principal, brought to the clinic. They tested her for epilepsy. They checked her over. Nothing was going wrong. The dean of students walked in, and he said these words, It's the power of God! Yes! Yes! Whoa! Y'all can sit in. And what you're going to experience is because you held your ground. See, it's a God thing. God is in this. So you don't have to worry about it. God is in this. God's doing this. And one young man, he came here and he'd been saved just a week. He came, he came up and said, Steve, the strangest thing happened yesterday. He said, I was at school. And he said, I've been saved for a couple days now. I was at school and then I rubbed up against one of my friends. I rubbed up against them and they fell to the ground. For those of you that have a struggle with all this, church historians, help them out. This has all been part of revivals for years gone by. But I tell you, I'm not studying past revivals to, to link with this one. I'm going, maybe this one is going to far excel. You know? Maybe, maybe this is the revival. This is the revival that they're going to say, you know, maybe 15, 20 years from now, that was the revival that in the schools, any chair... Any, anyone that was sitting in a chair in the classrooms, 
the Spirit of the Lord just swept through all the chairs. And that was the revival where they had pep rallies and everyone was slain under the power. That was the revival at the football game where they had to cancel the game. I'm talking about follow the Lord. Now, some of you still have a hard time with the shaking. That's okay. But I want to tell you, God does not have a hard time with it. Okay, he does not have a hard time with it. it is, it's the Spirit of the Lord coming on, folks. Are there, are, there, are there fakes out there? Are there kids that are faking it? Absolutely. Look at me, friend. John Wesley said, send us a revival without any defects. But if that's not problems, if that's not possible, send us a revival, defects and all. So there's always, friends, if you're a youth minister, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You get two or three hundred kids and you say, everyone raise their hands, you know, worship the Lord. Or you don't say that, you just say, worship the Lord. And they look around and a heathen's standing there and all his friends got their hands lifted up, but they don't want to look like an oddball. So they go, you know? And you go and you look at him and go, that's fake. That is fake. He doesn't know God. Why don't you keep your hands off of it? Maybe, just maybe, maybe God is doing something in that young man's spirit. Maybe a young a kid that comes down here and wants to fall out. They want to fall under the power. They just really, really, really want to fall under the power. And maybe they lean backwards. And finally they get what they always wanted. They fell to the carpet. And they're laying down there. And it was them. You know, it was them. I've had people grab my hand and they pushed themselves. Like this. I have. And I've grabbed behind them and pushed them forward because we barely touch them, man. They push themselves. And, and people really want to have some type of experience. But friend, how do you know? What, what, you don't know what God's going to do in that life. You don't know what God's going to do in the schools. You don't know what God's doing in these individual lives. I'm just, boy, I said all that to say this. There's a great awakening coming. Keep your hands off of it. Young people, Going back to that point, you follow God. You follow Jesus. No matter what comes your way, when the testings come, look at them straight in the face. Say, I'm a fool for Jesus. Whose fool are you? I'm after Jesus. I want everyone to stand, if you would. Charity, would you please come? Those of you with chairs, please move them off to the right and to the left. No one else moving around right now in the chapel. The other auditoriums, please don't move around. By the way, those of you that are still not convinced that God can use these kids, we've had some young people that have brought 15 unsaved friends to the revival. I mean, one person bringing 15 unsaved friends. Want to know why? Because at high school, the power of God was all over her in the hallway. And what you think, parent, what you think is it will turn young people off? No. They come, and you want to know who they meet? Jesus. They meet the Lord. Is it about shaking? No. Matter of fact, some of these kids, they'll have an experience, and they never have it again. I've been talking about shaking. But they go after God. They follow God. It's not about the manifestation. It's about the Messiah. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Now we're going to need every bit of this space. Richard in the chapel. I pray that people will obey the Lord in the chapel as they're going to obey the Lord here in the choir room, in the cafeteria. Obey God. Obey God tonight. I want everyone to look this way. Those of you moving the chairs, just put the chair up and then move off to the sides as quietly as you can. Charity's going to sing, Run to the Mercy Seat. Those of you, look at me, everyone. Those of you that are away from God, this is your opportunity to get right with God. Those of you that have never known the Lord, this is your opportunity right now to come meet Jesus. Those of you that are backslid, this is the time right now to get your heart right with God. Religious person that you say you know all about Jesus, but you don't know the Lord, I want to tell you, religion is hanging around the cross. Christianity is getting on the cross. There's a big difference. America is religious. America hangs around the cross. 
Christianity is getting on that cross. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's Christianity. So quit hanging around the cross looking at all the sweet things Jesus does. You're eating his bread, you're drinking his water, you're around his miracles, but you're not on the cross, friend. You don't know him. Tonight, you can know him, religious person. We've had people come to the Lord in this meeting that have been in the church 30, 40 years, but have never known the Lord. Now, here's what we're going to do. Charity's going to sing, Run to the Mercy Seat. As soon as she begins running, uh, singing, Run to the Mercy Seat, those of you... <laughs> That's a cue. Those of you, as soon as you begin singing, run to the mercy seat. Those of you that are away from God, you need to come as quickly as you can. 35,000 people have come, and a lot of them have run down here. You want to get right with God? You show him how serious you are. Oh, how come I have to go down there, Brother Steve? Let me ask you this question, friend. Why not? Why not? I'm going to throw it right back in your face, friend. There's only a few reasons why you wouldn't come down here. One is you're ashamed of him. Well, I'm not ashamed of him. The Bible says if you're ashamed of him, he'll be ashamed of you. If you'll confess him, he'll confess you. Another reason is pride. Pride. What are my friends going to think? What is my wife going to think? What is my boyfriend going to think? I want to ask you a question, friend. What does God think? See, you're not going to stand with your boyfriend on Judgment Day. You're not going to stand with your wife. You're going to stand alone. It's today. What's today's day? Today's the last day of July. On the, on the one day, friend, you're going to stand before God. And if you don't come down, if you don't get right with the Lord tonight, if you're away from God, say you don't get right with the Lord, period, and you stand before God on that final judgment day. I promise you, friend, listen to these words. July 31st, 1996 will ring in your ears. This altar call will ring. You'll stand before God, and you will not be able to look him in the face. Young people, you won't be able to look at God and say, Lord, you didn't give me a chance. All you'll see in front of you, among probably hundreds of other dates, July 31st, 1996, Brownsville, Brownsville, Brownsville. Clear message. Come to the Lord. He was crucified, died, and was buried. Rose again for you, friend, that you might have life. This is your opportunity. How to get the Lord's attention. Recognize that you have a need. You got that, friend? Recognize where you're at with God tonight. If you're away from God, you get down here as quick as you can as soon as she begins to sing. This is for those of you in the chapel, those of you in the cafeteria, in the choir room. You need to come as quickly as you can. Well, I'm going to get right. I'm going to say this one more thing, then we're going to do it. I'm going to get right at home after this meeting. You're right, preacher, but after this meeting, I'm going to go home and I'm going to get right with God. Look at me, friend. You are a liar. You are a liar. You're not going to get right with God. You know what you're going to do? You're going to go back to your bedroom, kneel by your bedside and say, God, you know me. Forgive me. I'm just a mess. And this is what you're going to hear. How come you couldn't go down to that altar? You'll hear this in your spirit. Are you ashamed of me? I was crucified nude for you. I died on the cross naked for you. And you couldn't walk 50 feet. You'll hear it, friend. You can hate me for saying this, but you'll hear this. You'll hear it. If you think you're going to go to your bedroom and get right at home in the secret of your own home, and the Lord's saying, I died publicly for you, and you couldn't walk down there and get right with me, friend, your Christianity... Your religion ain't worth 10 cents. This is a public altar call. This is not Assembly of God. It's not Baptist. It's not Episcopalian. This is for every single person that needs to get right with God. If you are away from Jesus, you need forgiveness tonight. You need the Lord to come down here and wash your sins away. Come right now. Hurry. Hurry right now. Come right now. Let's go. Let's go. Hurry right now. Hurry. Hurry right now in the chapel, in the choir room. Come on right now. Hurry. What are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? What are you waiting on?
not here to entertain you. Those of you at the altar, I hear the tears, I see the tears, and I hear the wailing before the Lord. Friend, we're not here to entertain you. I'm warning you, man. God's trying to speak to your life. He's speaking to your heart right now. How can you stand there? If you're not right with God, how can you stand there and say, some other day I'll get right with you? Today is the day, friend. He's speaking to you right now. What are you waiting on? Today is the day of salvation. Get down here right now. If you're away from God, get down here right now. Come on. Come on, right now. Get down here right now. I need forgiveness. Come on, step out. In the balcony, let's go. In the balcony, let's go. God bless you, son. Come on. I need forgiveness tonight. I need Jesus Christ to wash my sins away. Step out right now. Come on. Boy, I want to tell you, the other night I went up in the balcony to get you. I'll come up there tonight. If you don't come down right now, I'll come get you. I can look into your eyes and I can tell you're away from God. I can tell. Get down here right now, friend. Come on, right now. I need the Lord. I need the Lord in my life. Come on, right now. Come on. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. Don't you recognize your need for him tonight, friend? Come on. 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 I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Christians, you better do some interceding right now. There's some folks fighting. There's some folks fighting hell. Satan is going to do everything to keep you from this altar, friend. Get down here right now. Come on. God bless you. Come down from that balcony. God bless you. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Come on. Come on. Come on. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. Come on. God bless you. Come on. Come on. God bless you, yes. If you do not know the Lord, come down now. Come on. If you're away from God, come down. God bless. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Let's go. Get, come on. Come on. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Come on. Come on. God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. Come on. I need the Lord. Hurry. What are you waiting on? Come on. God brought you here tonight, son. Hallelujah. Come on. In the chapel, what are you waiting on? In the choir room, the cafeteria, what are you waiting on? Don't stand there. Don't you dare sit down. If you don't know God, you need to get down to these altars. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Don't you feel that? What are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? Come on. Charity, I'm going to have you sing it again. Everyone here that's away from God, everyone in the balcony that's away from the Lord, this is intercession for you, friend. You take an examination right now. Look inside your heart. If you don't know the Lord, if you're away from God, recognize that right now, friend. Don't lie. Don't lie to God and don't lie to the Holy Ghost and don't lie to us in this room. If you're away from God, step out right now as she sings this. God bless you. Come on right now. Come on right now. Come on, hurry. 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 Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. In the balcony, let's go. In the balcony, let's go. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. Come on, God bless you, son. Come on.
right now. If we stayed on this for another hour, and I'm not gonna, the aisles would be full. I know what's going on tonight. Some of y'all are fighting a spiritual battle. You know you need Jesus. You know you do. We're doing everything we can to help you. But if you leave out of here, friend, without knowing the Lord, you deserve what you get because you've clawed yourself away from God. How can you stand there? How can you sit there away from God when the Lord is pleading with you? He's pleading with you. He's weeping for you. He's broken for you. I want everyone to do this in this building. Those of you at the altar, stay right where you're at. In the chapel, choir room, cafeteria, I want you to do this. We're going to turn to the person next to us. Don't do it yet. Wait till I'm finished. You're going to turn to the person next to you and you're going to ask them if they need Jesus Christ to forgive them. Friends, look at me. When someone asks you that question, don't you lie. Not in this place. Not in this house. I tell you one of the things I'm praying for, and I'm asking God to bring back the judgment of Ananias and Sapphira to the church of America. They lied to God and died, church. I'm asking God to bring that back. They lied to the Holy Ghost, and they dropped dead right at Peter's feet. And fear spread throughout the land. If we need that in America, that's what we need right there in America. Do not turn to the person next to you. If they ask you if you need forgiveness and you know you're away from God, come on up, son. Come on. If you know you're away from God, don't look at somebody in the face and lie. Some bold-faced lie in church. If you know you're away from God, why don't you be a man? Why don't you be a woman? Look them in the face and go, I need Jesus, man. And then both of you, God bless you, sis. Both of you are going to come down here. Now, let me tell you what's happening during this time right now. We have had some of the most miraculous conversions right now during this time. We've had people turn to businessmen, wealthy businessmen, that did not know the Lord because somebody asked them. They both came down together, and that man was miraculously saved. We've had every kind of person imagine right now. There's people that have come to this church. I remember a young Mormon and a Jehovah's Witness. There's people that come to these churches, friend, these services, they don't know what's going on. But because somebody turned to them and said, I'll go with you down there. I'll go with you. That's what we're going to do right now. You're going to ask that person if they need forgiveness. In the balcony, look at me. Don't you lie when they turn to you. If you need Jesus Christ to wash your sins away, there is sin between you and God, and you know there is. You look them in the eyes, tell them the truth, say, yes, there is. Then both of you come down here together. Everyone do it right now. At the altar, stay right where you're at. Everyone do it right now. Let's go. Ask them right now, do you need forgiveness? And then come down with them right now. Do not lie. Come on, right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Let's go. Yes, God bless you. God bless you. Come on, right now. Come on. God bless you, sir. God, in the balcony. Yeah, God bless. God bless you. Come on. Come on now. Come on. Make room for them, workers. We need room. Come on. Come on. Come on, in the balcony. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Y'all make room for the folks coming down from the balcony. Come on. All the way up. All the way up. Step around some of these folks and get a place. Look up there. God bless you folks. Come on down. Come on. Come on. Come on. I'm closing this altar call. If you're supposed to be down here, you better get down here right now. God bless you girls. Come on down. For those of you that are visiting this revival, there may be a critic that's come here just to criticize everything. 
And you're looking at this, you're going, well, all those people aren't being saved. First of all, friend, you don't know what's going on in everybody's life. Second of all, we don't count this. Never have, never will. We don't count all this. We don't sit there and go, wow, write down all these numbers and publish them. The numbers you hear about this revival is about half of what we've seen come to the altar. About half. There's some nights we've had over a thousand people. There's some weeks that we've had two or three thousand people come to the altars and we haven't even changed the numbers. Haven't even changed the numbers. Because this isn't about figures. This is about lives, Fred. Lives are being changed. Tell you something else about altar calls, pastors. You throw the net out, let God take care of the rest. You don't know what God's doing. You don't know what he's doing in a personal life. Anybody else? Since God hears you, he hears a cry. Anybody else? You know you're supposed to be down here. on you. Come on. I want everyone at the altar to bow your head. We're going to pray together. Those of you in the other rooms, I want you to bow your head. Bow your heads. Now, some of you are here for the very first time. You've never, never known the Lord. Others of you are backslid. You're coming back to Jesus. Regardless of why you're here, I want to tell you God loves you and he's brought you here for this time. He's brought you here for this time. One of the things that we deal with in this revival is we deal with sin. Y'all coming up? Come on up, man. Come on. You've got to admit, keep your eyes closed, your heads bowed. I'm doing this because I don't want you to be distracted. You have to realize that what has been destroying your life is sin. Sin has separated you from God and only Jesus Christ can wash that away from your life. All your good works will never cover it up. All your good intentions won't do you a bit of good. You can sin and then spend two weeks down at the rescue mission serving soup. Your sin has not been touched. Your sin needs to be washed away by the blood of the Lamb. All your good works won't do it, friend. That's what we're going to take care of right now. Everyone at this altar, I want you to bow your head and pray this prayer with me right now. Dear Jesus, now we're going to pray it out loud. Everyone at the altar and in the other rooms, once again, dear Jesus, thank you for speaking to my heart. Thank you for not leaving me alone. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for speaking to me about Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me on Calvary. Thank you, Father, for sending your only Son. I ask you tonight to forgive me. Wash my sins away. Cleanse me. I have hurt you, and I've hurt others. Forgive me, Jesus. I ask you tonight to be my Lord, my Savior, and my very best friend. Tonight, Jesus, I give you my life 100%. I am yours, and you are mine. I will serve you all the days of my life. In your precious name, amen. Yes, Lord.